I was in Chennai at the time of the national movement. I didn't even know I am going to be an artist. Though I used to scribble a lot in those days. And um, I was studying in the Presidency College for a degree in economics. It was the time when this uh, Quit India movement started. I did, because of some kind of uh, compulsion within, draw and paint a lot during that time. And I used to stay in some digs in triplicate. Uh, there, we had a constant visitor. My uh, sort of a roommate was a research scholar from Kerala. And there was a visitor called Koni Krishnan who used to come there from time to time. And I later came to know that uh, he was a clerk in the art school. Then one day Koni Krishnan said, can you lend me some of your drawings? So I said, what will you do with them? No, I'll tell you that later. Then Koni Krishnan took those drawings to the art school apparently and showed it to Panikar. And Panikar showed it to Devi Prasad Rai Chaudhary. That was at the time when I was very busy with the student movement and uh, picketing and things of that kind. So one day while sitting in class, a kind of a liveried man came with this big letter. And um, my professor thought that is somebody from the police or the CID. But uh, that was not the case. It was a letter from Devi Prasad Rai Chaudhary, who said, can you come and meet me quickly one day? So, I didn't do it. I sort of wrote a small note and gave it to him. I'll come as soon as I can, sort of. I did meet him after about a year, uh, three days. But he had written in the note that, look, the reason why I want to see you is that you have missed your profession. You are in the wrong place, kind of a thing. So I went and met him and he said, well, why don't you come and join the art school and stop sort of doing your economics degree and uh, we'll give you every facility. In those days, he was like a, the king of your school. I mean, he could arrange anything for you. It was very nice of him, but then I was in the midst of the other boy, so I said, look, as soon as I can get free from it, probably I'll consider. He was very nice. Really speaking, before that, I never thought that somebody will take what I was doing very seriously and I will become an artist myself. But that put the kind of a uh, little kind of ambition in me, saying maybe that's a kind of a career I can sort of. So to that extent, I owe it to him. And to, in an indirect way, to Panikar, because if Panikar had not shown those drawings to him. It was not. But in the meanwhile, I didn't like the atmosphere of the art schools of that time, the government art schools especially. And somehow, from my early age, I had a lot of information about what was happening in Shantiniketan, mainly through articles in Modern Review and things of that kind, which our libraries used to get in those days. And I had a great desire that I should go and study, if at all, there. But then anyway, let's see. But Things happened in a sort of a curious way. Uh, we picketed the secretariat when uh, the national movement was coming on its slow in the 1943, I think, early. And um, all of us were probably the, the top level students of all the colleges of that time. And uh, we all got into jail. We were sent to, kept some time in the penitentiary and then sent to a jail.
Well, the whole question is all government students of that time uh, used to follow the old um, academic um, British school discipline. They were, including the teachers, were trying to get rid of it, but they didn't know how to get rid of it. And they didn't have a kind of a alternative view of how to do that. That is where uh, probably the people in the Tagore circle uh, did better. They didn't want to sort of, they didn't always think that, well, the academic thing has to be thrown away. Or if it is thrown away, that you should cut out uh, all your relationship with the rest of the world. But you have to be somebody belong to this country, but in a larger world kind of a thing. They had a clearer idea about that than in those people in the art school. And I think it is still so. Most of these art schools suffer from this kind of a The individual artists have to get out of the art school to get their own feet. But in the art school, they are like penned animals. And they do not have a sort of a program that introduces them. To it. Anyway, the whole question is that was only the background of the whole thing. But the here was I went to jail, but in the meanwhile, since I was from the presidency college, the government took it very seriously. So they banned my entrance from any government institution. So in a sense, it was God sent to me, so I couldn't go to the government art school at all. And in any case, at that time, I didn't think of the art school. The person who thought of the art school was my brother, who without my knowledge, sort a letter to Nandalal Bose, saying that I have a sort of a runaway brother like him. So, would you consider him for the... Without sending him anything uh, about me except this much. So, I, I didn't know it at that time, but suddenly in sometime in February, I think 1944, I got a telegram saying, come. So that's how I went to Shantaniketan. Shantaniketan experience was very good to me. In fact, there was, at that time, it was not a sort of university like it is now. It is a sort of a non-institutional institution kind of a thing. Uh, more a kind of a community of people who reacted on each other. The teachers did not even pretend to teach nor did the students had to sort of a sit in the class and learn. I mean, they could just move around them and sit. So that free atmosphere was very appealing to me at that time. And people from Kerala themselves are a little rebellious of being told what to do. Because at home, there is always a sort of a head man, head of the family who is trying to insist that you should do this. So it comes perhaps from that. So, I spent about three and a half years there, and by that time, sort of, I was ready for getting the, what, at that time, there was no examination, nothing, only a final show, and you got a diploma. There were these two things. On one side, artists and writers, want to a certain extent uh, insist on their kind of a rootedness in the soil. On another side, they knew that rootedness doesn't mean following the same old roots that your previous people done. You have to live in your times and probably respond to the times. And uh, that would mean that you are going to be contemporary whether you like it or no, if you are quite a serious artist. Otherwise, you will be kind of a tradition mongering sort of a yeah, um, craftsman of some kind. So the question is not between the content and manner. At that time, 
what were the essentials of a content and what should it be a I mean, there wasn't any serious art criticism or any people you thought about, uh, you know, talked about it. Except her as people, some people in the Calcutta circles and in, uh, like, and then in the Tagore circles. In fact, some of the most revealing talks about this question of indigenousness and contemporaneity is. Um, in the lectures by Abhinandanath Thakur, which is only available in Bengali even today, called the Bhageshwari lectures. I didn't know it at that time. I came to know it only later. No, what I'm saying is there wasn't enough of a clear thinking at that time in the rest of the world. So wherever they thought of indigenism, they thought of an indigenous manner or indigenous subject matter. They didn't think in terms of indigenous attitude to the world that was, which uh, was not the same thing in Shantaniketan. There, the whole question is, Tagore is in a sense, uh, as a poet, very indigenous, but he is also very modern. Similarly, all those artists in that circle, they wanted to function in a kind of a cultural continuum in which India was there, in which the rest of the world also was there. So, from that point of view, the kind of the work that people like uh, Nandalal or Binod Bihari or Ram Kinkar did at that time have a certain kind of uh, backbone, which many of the other artists works did not have at that time. This is not to say that they didn't do good work, but many of them were not quite sure about the attitude they should take, including Rai Chaudhary. Rai Chaudhary was a very excellent artist. He could almost handle any medium very well, and he meant well, and I have heard from others that he had also other talents. He was apparently a consummate ah, sort of a wrestler, flute player, <laughs> and things of that kind. Now, and a very nice man, all right. But then the whole question is, he did not think in the direction, though he was very close to people like Abhinandanath Tagore. He was not quite so sure whether he should follow the medal sent by the RC, the Royal Academy people or this kind of thing. And he tried to mix them up and always did not do it too well. But this is an afterthought. I mean, I'm not saying that I was sort of criticizing him at that time or I didn't have the power to either. The question of having a sort of a art craft continuum kind of a thing came much earlier uh, with the Abhinanda Tagore and especially Nandalal Bose. Because when he started the Kalabhan Art School, he was one person who wanted to say that this art craft thing should not be kept separate. In a sense, even the government art schools had crafts workshops. And many of the people who planned the government art schools also wanted a certain kind of link up, which never took place, partly for the reason that um, many people in the public, they thought that craft part of it is related to working with the hand. The other thing is should be working with the head. This kind of thing. And, uh, they somehow, even people, especially it came to a head when uh, E.B. Havel tried to indigenize the teaching methods in Calcutta Art School. A group of the students thought that this was a kind of a colonial administrator's sort of a stratagem to deny them the Western kind of techniques, this sort of a thing, <laughs> which is certainly not true. But then they thought so, because they thought that, ah, we should be as good as the other painters there in England kind of a thing. Unfortunately, the whole year is that, but in a place like, uh, sort of a, uh, in, the, in the Tagore circle, 
they always thought that they should learn, I mean, to Ravindranath Tagore, he thought in terms of a total art language. As early as I think 1917 or so, he had been writing about the, of course, even in his essays or literary criticism. You see, we are getting too precious. Precious in contact with your old tradition, precious with contact with the kind of a tradition that comes from outside. While inside, at the creative roots of this country, there is a language which is already running and we should learn from it. And he made a certain effect as early as that, asking his friends to collect various kinds of artworks in different parts of the world. Well, he didn't have time to sort of see it through, but then Nandalal Bose did that. That is why he wanted art and craft teaching the same person should, and then he should learn from each, and to this extent saying that each kind of art has its own kind of language. No, really speaking, what I am saying is that this effort was always there. In fact, even Nandalal, has um, written two books, again in Bengali. One is uh, Shilpa Katha, which is about his thoughts on art, and in which he says, in what kind of uh, an atmosphere have you to develop art? This sort of, how do you relate it to the life around? And then uh, another thing called Shilpa Charcha, in which he is analyzing various kinds of art and craft methods and techniques and things of that kind. So there it was there. And then when I came back from Santanikas and met um, Panika, he was very excited about this whole thing. And then Panika was probably even pushed in that direction, especially after he went to England and met uh, Ludwig Goldscheider. That was a sort of a major event in his life. From being an exceptionally good watercolorist and painter in the Western style, he suddenly sort of shifts his boats. He becomes very consciously indigenous and then in a new way. And then the Panikas, the idea of um, Cholamandal and this art craft movement. It, at least it is very parallel to what movement there was before in sort of a Shantaniket. Whether Panikar knew about it or not, I don't know. He might have just thought it out from his own mind. But then I did tell him that when he said that after retirement I am thinking of this and getting this piece of land, they are giving me this piece of land. Then I told him, do you know that when Shantaniketan school Kalabhavan started, at that time, Nandalal Bose was thinking, what will these artists do when they go out into the world? How will they support themselves? So he formed what was called a Karu Sangha. Uh, because in Bengali, they call art charukala and karukala is what is craft, this sort of thing. So they called a karu sangha. And the karu sangha, at that time in Shantaniketan, there was this also the village industries unit in Shiniketan. And they used to take design pro problems for the various affluent people in the various parts of the country. So, this Karusanga could probably work in tandem with them. It didn't work too well. He started it, but the idea was there. So, I had told that what probably Nandalal didn't succeed in, you will probably be able to do that. I remember having told him that. But, and it has, because you see, this has lasted and it has been dear quite a while, for, for a while. The only thing is that um, an artist community trying to earn by craft is a very difficult problem. This is. Sometimes it also exerts a certain kind of pressure in their thinking too. 
making their art become too arty or the craft become too crafty or interact with each other. There was a big chance at one time for the art school. This was when um, Panikar himself was the principal of the art school. At that time, I had for a while gone from Baroda for about two years and worked with the handloom board in, and come into contact with various people who was later helpful to me, like Pupul Jayaka and then Sabanayakam, who was then the chairman of the handloom export organization. So when we were recruiting people for the design unit in here, we found, in spite of all the talent in South India, there was nobody came up to that uh, sort of a. So once we were discussing it, why is this happening? There is a kind of a disjuncture in their teaching or learning that um, they feel a little um, sort of a diffident about how to sort of a. So there was an effort made to change the structure of the art school. I was a member of that committee. There was Shankar Chowdhury was a member of the committee. Savan Ayagam at that time had become the chief secretary of the Madras State and Mrs. Jayaka was a member of the committee. Then we made a proposal that the whole thing should be done more or less on the model of the Baroda Art School. And uh, your teaching should have discourse units so that people become as knowledgeable as they can with the alone. And uh, it went through, but it was never implemented. To a certain extent, of course, all the art schools, the old art schools have been resistant to all this because they were at one time art and craft schools under the Ministry of uh, the Department of Industries. They always thought, I mean, they were not related to the universities as such. Now, of course, incidentally, the universities take interest in these art schools. But as a kind of an academic discipline which needs as much discursive knowledge as much as skills, that is not uh, sort of accepted by them. So they have. So most of the people who sort of uh, make good from those art schools, it is not that it doesn't have talent. They all come out of the art school, then they make good outside in the world. The art school itself doesn't help them. To a certain extent, it cramps them. Uh, it also makes them sort of uh, very nervous about sort of facing the world. Otherwise, we have had uh, talent from South India and Kerala and all coming here in and even today, some of the young artists who are like making a name in Bombay, they are not related directly outcome of the art schools. They are people who have made themselves in that kind of situation. So it's not a question of lack of talent. It's a lack of sort of a little vision in the educational institutions. But then you can't blame everything on somebody. It's not the thing. It is just like that. In fact, whenever I go to uh, south, which is not very often, I always feel that Madras is such a sort of wonderful place. It's the atmosphere of music, dancing, everything is good. But in the visual art, it is absolutely, I mean, it's not sort of a, as dynamic enough as it can be. And it can, but if, it, if they make an effort. But that effort has to come. And the same thing with Kerala. Kerala, the writers are good. They probably keep up with the world in all kinds of things and all. But when it comes to the art school, it's a ruin. I make it a point to go and visit Cholamandal because I like the place. And some of the young artists I knew, I like Aridas and all this thing, and the, I mean, these people, and then Panikar's son. But I have never known them very closely. So really speaking, the persons I have been sort of close to was Panika and Danapal. But then the Cholamandal idea still appeals to me and I am very happy when last time I went, I went and saw their 
exhibition hall was coming up. So I said that's a very great thing when they are, and I hope the activity also improves that way. So the future is bright, but then the whole question is you have to have a sort of concerted effort. And uh, there is also, I think, uh, Tamil Nadu, the government is very parochial. It is not thinking in terms of the world, it is thinking only of its small problems. Okay, so if they think of the world, only the businessmen do. How can we make money by selling our goods outside kind of a thing? But in giving a guy a kind of a big push for a cultural development, I mean in the present day society, there are little things coming up here and there, things of that kind. But the government itself, I, whenever I talk to them, they say they are not helpful. Otherwise, that should have been a wonderful art school. Art criticism can take place only if there are informed connoisseurs. But unfortunately, in our country, the informed connoisseurs are very few. Most people who came into especially art criticism in the field of visual arts are more or less briefless journalists. I mean, they didn't make good in the other areas of reporting and this thing or political commentary. Then they took the sort of way, except a few. I mean, the whole question is. Here again, the person who made a big impact on A was a Bengali art critic for Sarkar. That was in, again in the 20s, 30s. Mm. His art criticism is still very well informed and very A, and we may not agree with all his views, but real art criticism. Otherwise, most of the people have not. And then other. Uh, Occasionally, we have had art criticism from people who have seen the world and they are all Westerners. They overloaded the whole thing. In fact, in uh, the art business in Bombay, had uh, three Westerners who were presiding over it. And one of them was a critic, Leyden. Last time I met Leyden, uh, he had come here and spent some time here. And he has presented uh, sort of uh, all his press cuttings to the college here. At that time I was still here. So then he said, um, somebody said that you have published a book of your essays on art. So I said, I'll lend it to you, you see whether. Then he finished it in one day. The next day he comes and tells me, you know, I have given all that to you. I think that I didn't know a lot of things when I wrote about art at that time. He was honest, but many people will not be that honest. Similarly, you had Charles Fabry in Delhi. Charles Fabry was a knowledgeable man, but he was a museum man. And the other thing is that he was a man with um, uh, sort of a strong likes and dislikes. Good art criticism uh, all over the world is very hard to come by. In fact, about, I think about um, two generations back, there was a lot of good art criticism in England and America all coming from people who studied art and took to art criticism. So they had an inside knowledge of the problems this thing and all. In fact, many of those people, now their books are read, but then, but that generation of art criticism is no more there, again there. I mean, they are all. Now you see, you were talking about the kind of a galleries and the A and all. Now, this thing is, at one time, the attitude that we had about art was, art was a kind of a communication between person and person and a kind of an intimate communication. 
and uh, the main thing that criticism should uh, focus on will be how intimate can you make it kind of of course it had its own problems what the artist thought and the receptivity of the person who looked at art they are all very different so to build a bridge between that you have to have a very resourceful and sensitive art critic but the kind of criticism now is because of the uprise of this new art trade it is mostly promotional writing that is how to sort of uh, make this commodity how to package it well so that it goes and even if you give it a kind of a package by a few words of criticism how to make it uh, visible to the public so most of these art criticism works this way you either pull down a person or push up a person but the main interest is how to put him in the eyes of the public and um, so even if you criticize a person and say that uh, hussein's work is trash but hussein people will go and look at hussein's paintings why is it trash kind of a thing so this happens now promotional writing and this kind of a writing it's almost a kind of a market based thing and this has happened all over the world no artist uh, is a better artist because he is a hungry fellow <laughs> even artist earns money and lives well it is something he deserves to but the whole yeah is this that money in itself is not everything every sort of a mature person should think that um, when you have something to say and you need a kind of a reasonable life today that is good enough but then what you want to say should be independent of all these considerations this is there will probably be people like that but then there will also be people young people who make good money by doing things which the market accepts readily i do not blame them because at one time i mean i would only class them they are tantamount to those people when the market was good for good craft goods people made craft goods and sold it to them to please the public as they wanted so like that they are doing it i mean i have nothing against them the other thing is this the question is today the question of communication has become a little more complex than before now you see in fact only the recently when i was um, talking to a group of students in bangalore so i was sort of talking about this at one time art was such that well it publicized things maybe religion or the people in power things of that kind so it communicated in a certain way but it went beyond the communication and it also sort of fixed your mind on certain things which he projected so it went beyond it and that's why it became art so all these temples are probably communications of sort but then they live there by their own dynamism by this sort of a thing but now what has happened is that there is a big communication industry and it has its tools which are quite subtle and uh, they are able to do it very well and this communication industry especially in the commercial industry when they sort of use the kind of a tools that are available to them now they have tried to analyze what tool works in what way and how did the message go through on what kind of people is it targeted and for targeting it what we have to do means they have to a certain extent become like the they have codified the whole thing 
like uh, probably Bharatamuni codified the dancing this thing. We could see those people who are using communication for specific purposes. So it has become so big that, uh, like you say, that um, it has become kind of a tail that wags the dog, you see. So now all artists also want to make communication methods. They want to do videos, they want to do multi-purpose uh, sort of uh, projections, they want to do installations. My main aim is that it is not bad at all. In fact, whatever is available you should use. The only thing you should do it a little better than the others do it. But unfortunately that is not the case. Now most of the artists use all these things just before the novelty of the thing. But the commercial communicators do it much better. As far as the art scene, the art education is concerned, I mean, I would rather compare it to sort of a, what you call the rainforest. If you leave us alone, we will do better. Don't try to mold us too much. But give us space, give us space where this rainforest can grow. If there is talent enough, it will grow quite uh, lush without your aid. Then the artists themselves will adjust to the various things that need it. That is not happening. The government wants to show that it is doing something for culture, but it is unable to do that thing for culture. It has to justify people that, well, part of the sort of income they are utilizing it. But apart from an exhibition or this thing and or also extravagance, they are unable to do it. In fact, all things, wherever anything has taken place, has taken place on the basis of uh, the practitioners and the connoisseurs and their group effort. Shantaniketan was in its heyday when it had no money. So was Kalakshetra. So was Kalamandalam. Now they have got money, they have got here, they have got certain kind of projection. I don't grudge them that. But then they have to see that that is not the thing that makes the institution, but the work within. This is the, so that is what I would say. That if anything has to be, this is, there should be more communication between groups of artists and culture people. And they should work together. And it should have this interworking that, uh, uh, like in a rainforest. When we started the Badada school, we means I was one of the junior staff members there. So I should not so when we, I should say we because. But uh, it is true that many of our senior colleagues, they valued whatever I had to say at that time. So now many people think that I made some kind of a contribution in saving at that time. What it wanted to do was this, that a kind of a culture worker of today, he is living in what is called a modern cultural situation. And what is a modern cultural situation? It is a cultural globalization of sorts. I mean, Various kinds of cultural forms are floating around you. While you have your own sort of a cultural form, there are other cultural forms which are comparable or which are against the a grain of this thing floating around you. So it is necessary for you to develop your own integrity to know what they are and to find out what you can learn from them and what you can probably teach them kind of a thing. So we wanted to build an institution where it will be a kind of a milling ground of these various forms. So, and we thought for that you should have the students or the people who want to become artists go through a multimedia exposure on all these things and they should have their critical acumen. Then they can choose what they want to do. And. Uh, Side by side with it, they will learn various kinds of skills which will interact on each other. In the first 15 years, we were able to do that to some extent. And the university supported us very well. 
Of course, once you make a name and you make a mark, the university tries to wean you out. So that support was not continuously coming out. So I know the another 15 years that I was here, I found that the university was not that interested because he said, oh, it has already made a name. But then there were many other things we had to do. We wanted that this place should be a kind of a place where we will have all the archival material necessary for the interactions of this sort to learn about word and art and this sort of a thing, discuss it. That has still not happened. Though we started very well, the university has almost starved out the institution. Even today, they do not have the facilities of various other small institutions. They have those few buildings and um, these young staff members are trying to keep the whole thing alive in various ways. But then they do not have all the things they need to. And to a certain extent now, the attitudes also have changed. Because when I told you about this uh, kind of a communication industry and things of that kind, today what we need is not this kind of specialization. Because nobody is going to be specialized today. He wants to learn everything and learn and then use them all together. So we should have various workshops where you can relate to and put this. Now that will mean a little bit of replanning. Before I left this place, I had at one time made a kind of a rough statement about what could be to the vice chancellor of that time. But then all these uh, blueprints make uh, no sense after a while. It was a sort of a 20 year plan and I wanted that our, this thing should go into these communication areas, that is visual communication. And uh, if it had done at that time, then this institution will become one of the primary institutions. It's happening all over the world, but we are not doing it. But we started so well.